Authors tell all. Um, we'll tell most of it, but maybe not all of it. So uh, why don't I just read the description, and maybe something in here will will go along with what you're thinking. Uh, if you're planning or thinking about writing a memoir, so the craft of memoir writing requires introspection, honesty, clarity of message, and sheer guts to get the story on paper. There's no telling how many begin the process. But due to the enormity of telling a personal story, few finish. The five memoir panel, a memoirist on this panel, stared at a blank page when they began, much like you have done or you're doing or you're in the process uh, of working through a memoir. Uh, would they hurt family members? That's a big one. How to find the time to write? We think it's big, but it's not. Uh, what's the fine line between an autobiography and a memoir, such as we don't want you to begin with, I was born on January 8th, 19, whatever. Uh, and then go through your school years and high school, no. We want you to take a particular event in your life, usually that's what gets it going. You fill in your story, your backstory, with that event. Um, the next thing would be, what's the fine line, I, think I did that, um, was your story boring? That's a good one. Um, but the most important thing of any for any memoir author is to confront the truth and to come out of the memoir having learned from the experience told to others. So with that background, you can begin to think about maybe some questions you'd like to answer us. We've all gone through these questions here, and what you see in front of us uh, are our books that are out for purchase. You can buy them right on, on, the, on the table here. So I'll explain a little bit about myself. My name is Judith Glynn. I live in New York City. I also live, I'm a Rhode Islander, and I live in Fox Point. I've been there for the last 20 years or so. But in New York, in my neighborhood in Hell's Kitchen, several decades ago, I saw a homeless woman um, on the street. And I saw her for a while. She was with a pack of men. I eventually said, who are you? Uh, her name was Michelle Browning. She was from Italy. Uh, 33 years old, been on the street for about seven years, uh, which is just incredible. Talk about medieval times. I began to befriend her. I never took her to my apartment, and I never gave her money. I'm not a social worker, and I'm not a do uh, However, there was something about her that turned my heart. Eventually, after these two years, I convinced her to let me call her family in Italy, who had no idea that she was on the streets of New York in the condition that she was in. I did end up taking her home. So this is the story of Michelle and me. Uh, it's called The Street or Me, A New York Story. The title means The Street or Me, I would say to her several times, Marie, which her name is Marie, or Michelle or Marie or Blondie, whatever. Uh, you have a choice. You choose the street or you choose me because uh, she was at the point of really no return. And she asked me many times, would I send her home in a body bag? I said, I would. But I would certainly prefer to send her home or take her home. I didn't expect to take her home. That's another big point of these books. Some of my families say, well, and the, 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 the angst of trying to get her on her plane and get her home, and my son from Exeter came up from Rhode Island to help me. Uh, talk about family members. Uh, he also uh, decided he would take some pot they put it in a suitcase and uh, take it with him to Italy. That was an interesting scene. Um, I have a very, I had sort of a uh, misunderstood and, and mean, angry mother. I had to put a whole chapter in about that. So it was a wonderful journey. I learned a lot. And the reason this is so uh, on point for every page was that I wrote it as it was happening, which will help a lot when you're writing your memoir. Um, the dialogue is true. The scenes were fresh because I had really nobody else to tell it to. No one understood what I was doing in New York when I was in this room. So anyway, I'm sure my time has gone past my five minutes. Um, but you can do that when you're on the panel. <laughs> so, I uh, didn't need me. I will introduce each of them and give the description that they would like to me to read to you. They too have their five minutes. And uh, their books are for sale, and also please keep in mind there's a, hopefully a question and answer time at the end. So beside me, and we do this by alphabetical uh, names, 
officer is not to favor anybody, although we wouldn't do that. Uh, Linda Cavelli is the author of Perfectly Negative, How I Learned to Embrace Life's Lemons as Lessons. Her story chronicles a decade of overwhelming loss, some of which includes her parents and her only sister's death, all to cancer. After Linda's bout with the disease, and when she lost her 14-year career in corporate America, those events were the game changer and basis for Linda's path to a winning lifestyle. Thank you, Joe. Can everybody hear me okay? No? Closer, closer, is that better? Okay. So thank you all for being here today. Um, I for one, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share my story with you and the journey that I took on memoir writing road. I'll say that three times fast. So um, I've always loved to write, and um, for the longest time, however, my writing was for my eyes only. As a young girl, I, as a young girl, my locked diary knew about all the typical girl drama that I got caught up in. And during my, excuse me, during my second year of college, only my journal knew how frightened I was when my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. And when I met the man that, I, that would become my first husband, my journal knew all the doubts I had about our relationship. At some point, I realized that I only wrote when I felt confused, sad, angry, or mad. Or confused, sad, or angry and that reading my journal helped me sort out my thoughts and helped me move forward. My mom was re-diagnosed with terminal breast cancer four weeks before my first wedding. To prevent my hand from falling off, I started to type in my computer instead. My mom passed away two years after that, and the following ten years were filled with one heartache after another. My sister was diagnosed with breast cancer, my husband divorced me. My sister was re-diagnosed with breast cancer. Our dad passed away of leukemia. I was then diagnosed with breast cancer. My sister passed away. And to top it all off, my living boyfriend was keeping a mistress on our boat, <laughs> docked only about a mile away from our house. Throughout the 10 years, however, one constant in my life was writing. And as you can imagine, I had a lot of journals. The other constant was that I still continued to keep my journals to myself. It wasn't until after my sister passed away that I started to attend a writing workshop. My writing instructor and fellow classmates uncovered the courage I never knew I had. As I read my stories out loud for my eager listeners, I was reminded of a long forgotten goal I had to write a book. I never imagined that my life would be the top topic of that book, but I realized the powerful impact my life story could have on many more people, people who may be dealing with one or more of the painful experiences that I dealt with. As Judith mentioned, I lost my corporate job after 14 years, and after everything I had lost pre previously, it was that job loss that helped me realize how negative events can actually transform into something positive, and that sometimes things really do happen for a reason. I decided to turn my writing hobby into my full-time job, a non-paying job, unfortunately. I hired a writing coach slash book architect who not only pushed me to write 5,000 words per week, but he also helped me to structure the book and he found its theme. My transformation actually began when I realized that my life was best described by the theme of my book. And that is that everything happens for a reason, we just don't get the reason at the same time as the thing. You see, it took me 10 years of heartache to finally put my life in perspective and give meaning to my suffering. I realized how each heartache, each loss, each death had actually prepared me for the next one and the next one after that. Each lemon turned out to be a valuable lesson for me to consider as, a, as my life moved forward. Writing a book is hard, at least it was for me. Very hard. <laughs> and a memoir, I think, is a little bit harder. I always knew that rehashing the most painful years of my life would be emotional. Ding, dong, ding. 
but I never anticipated the personal transformation I would experience. What should I skip? No. I think the end result of my memoir is that it's about resilience. It's not a story about being a victim, blaming others, or getting revenge. During the process of writing and reading my memoir, I started to see my past life with a new perspective and live my, my remaining life with a new mindset. And that mindset is something I call a learner's mindset. Basically, I view each experience as an experiment, and I make mental, and sometimes I still write notes about what worked well and what the experience can teach me as I move forward. Perfectly Negative is really about embracing all that life has to offer, accepting that the bad stuff actually may have a purpose, even if only to help us recognize and appreciate the good stuff. And maybe most important, that when we bounce back from the bad stuff, we're able to help ourselves heal, others heal, and help them bounce back too. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next author is Kitty Kachel. She's the author of Breathe, which you see in front of her. Kitty, you, excuse me, isn't that awful? Oh goodness, it's the Kachel that threw me off. So it's Kelly. in my book. Okay, oh Lord. Uh, I won't be the moderator next year. Okay, Kelly Kittel is the author of Breathe, Hold Up Your Book, um, an award-winning story of motherhood, the death of two of her children, a medical malpractice lawsuit, and family conflict in the face of unspeakable tragedy. Kelly lives on Quidnick Island with her husband and three of her five living children, but her favorite writing space is in their yurts on the Oregon coast. Kelly has been published in numerous magazines and anthologies. Go. Thank you. I'm going to rush through this. Um, thanks for the nice introduction. I feel like I'm at the kids' table. <laughs> I'm not sure why. And I do have water. I don't know what you guys are drinking. All right. So, um, yeah, quickly, because um, what I want to talk to you about today is the question of will my book hurt family members and do I have to change names? And that's a huge topic for five minutes. Um, quickly, my book, as Judith said, is about motherhood. Uh, the, excuse me, the subtitle is Motherhood, Grief, and Family Conflict. The motherhood portion is exactly that. I always wanted to have a huge family. Um, I was pregnant 13 times and I have five living children. The grief part portion is that this book recounts the story of losing our fourth child, Noah, who was run over when he was 15 months old by my 16, then 16-year-old 16 niece in my in-law's driveway. So lots of family there. And nine months later, our next baby Jonah died at birth. So we buried two boys in one year. It was a horrible year. Um, and then the family conflict portion. Um, this book is an extreme example of family conflict. It's family conflict on steroids. Um, I don't know if other families could have weathered all of that and, and come through gracefully, but ours did not. My husband is the youngest of eight, this was his sister's child, and unfortunately they moved to blame and denial. And that's what makes this book a page turner, is the family conflict portion, because it's just too crazy. I always say if it wasn't my life, I would never believe it. Um, so um, it, the book concludes with a medical malpractice trial for the death of Jonah, at which my sister-in-law testified against us. So it's pretty crazy, and when it, um, people would always say to me, like, when are you going to write your book? I would always say, well, first I have to figure out how many family members I want to alienate, right? Um, and then they all became aliens anyway. So um, maybe some of you are toying with the idea of writing a true story that involves family members or people that you know, and you're wondering about whether you can use real names. I have five things I'm hoping to say about that, so let me rush into that. Um, number one, when you write your book, make sure all your characters are three-dimensional, right? Your book, even though it's a memoir, has to pass muster with fiction writers. One of my fiction writers is in the back over there. Um, it has to be a page-turner, and all of your characters have to be believable, right? So it's hard. It's hard to make three-dimensional characters out of people that you don't like. Um, but you have to try to make them all sympathetic characters and explain to your readers who you're writing for why somebody like this could do something like that kind of thing, right? Breathe is a love story at its heart to my sons. 
but like I said, it's the family conflict that drives the plot. So it's a difficult thing sometimes to balance those two, but that is our job as, as memoirists. The second thing, should I change names? I was never gonna change my own name. I wasn't gonna change the name of my sons. You always write initially um, using real names, so the real story will come out of your fingertips or your pen. But then after that, you struggle with the idea of whether or not you should change them. As soon as I started thinking, what if I said my son Noah was run over by Kathy Smith, it stopped being a story, like right then and there. It was dead in, in the water. So I did not change names in this book, and I'm happy to talk about, any, talk about that to anyone afterwards. Um, Nadine Gordimer says you have to write like everyone you know is dead. And I, I would recommend that. Some authors change their own names. Um, some say you should always change names, but there's, there's a lot to that. I say change them if you can, but if you can't, you don't have, necessarily have to. The third thing, make sure that you're not saying things that are li libelous or can be, that can't be verified, right? My sister-in-law's an alcoholic, but you're not gonna find that in this book. I wasn't gonna say anything like that, right? Um, stick to the facts as much as you can. The fact that my family inserted themselves into our lawsuit made them a part of, our, of the public record so that helped me in terms of the legal aspects of whether or not I could use their names. And maybe you won't have that. I hope you won't have that as part of your story, actually. But um, remember that people don't want things that they're hiding to be revealed. So that is a real issue that, that you have to um, consider. But what do they say? If people wanted you to write favorably about them, they would have behaved better, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, it's not always possible. Consider getting legal vetting. You can hire an intellectual property lawyer. I did that. Ultimately, he said, you have to roll the dice. You basically just, there's no protection. People can sue you for, for anything, right? But you have to determine ultimately whether or not it's worth it. And um, the burden of proof is always on the claimant. Um, memoir's been given kind of a bad name with people like James Fry and Craig Mortensen, you know, writing these pseudo memoirs. So there's a there's sort of a big hill to conquer there. But remember, memoir is is not revenge, like Linda just said. Although I used to think it was. Um, but if there's something that's nagging at you at the end of the day when you've written your book and revised it a million times, maybe reconsider it. The fourth thing is you're going to write a disclaimer in the beginning of your book. You can use one that's already been crafted or craft your own. But basically. Your publisher's not going to take any risk. You, you have all the risk when it comes to this book. Um, but you're going to write a disclaimer saying that you've changed, you know, identifying details, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the truth is, is for you. And hopefully that will put people off, off your scent. Okay, the fifth thing is advanced copies. You're going to give your book to anyone that you think might object. <clears throat> that are, these are friends, not foes, <laughs> right? Um, I gave my book, you know, to a lot of my family members that are mentioned, etc. in the book, and the only thing that I ended up changing was my mother. I had said, my mother said, shit or get off the pot, and my mother said, you cannot say that I said that. I don't want people to think that I swear, even though everyone knows that my mother swears and that she always said that. And so my lovely dad said, just say I said it. And my dad has never said that in his life. So there's one untruth in this book, and it's where it says, as my dad would say, it's not true. At the end, of the, at the end you know, I, even when it, this was about, it had been through its third iteration, through revisions and all that, I was still questioning whether or not it was the wisest thing to do. But my husband was adamant that we don't change anyone's names. These are most of his family members, so that was good. My, my daughter said, Mom, You've had the strength to get this far, and I know you have the strength to see this through. So keep going. And finally, I'll leave you with what my son Micah said. He said, Mom, be a warrior, not a worrier. <laughs> there you go. Thank you very much. Oh, you made it. Oh, you made it. Yeah. And now we have a little change of pace here. Uh, this is Debbie Kanan Tillinghast. He's the author of The Ferry Home. This is a memoir about childhood on Prudence Island, which is located in Narragansett Bay off the coast of Bristol. It took Debbie 60 years and a long walk one day where she decided to revisit those cherished memories destroyed 
when Hurricane Carol swept away the island way of life, forcing Debbie's family to relocate on the mainland. There you go. Okay, first, can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here and share with you what compelled me to write The Fairy Home, as well as the unexpected reward at the end of my writing journey. First, I want to tell you that my island legacy began long before I was born. My grandmother was born on Block Island, and my mother was born on Patience Island, a tiny next door neighbor to Cruz. There were only two houses there when she was born, and no school. So when it was time for her to go to school, the family moved to Prudence. It was 1919. And she lived there, went to the one-room school, and grew up until she went off to college. A few years later, she met and married my dad. They came back to Prudence to raise their family, and that's where my story begins. We lived there year-round. My dad ran a store in the summertime, and my mom became the teacher now in the one-room schoolhouse until 1954. Hurricane Carol destroyed my dad's store and changed our lives forever. We moved off the island a year later. Over the years, as I grew up, went to college, married, had a family of my own, Trips back to the island were infrequent, but Prudence still lived inside me. <laughs> and then one day, a few years ago, I was walking with my son on a cold February day, and he said to me, Mom, are you okay? You don't seem quite yourself. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And I thought for a minute, and I said, I'm fine. But I feel like there's something I'm supposed to do, and I have no idea what it is, and it's driving me crazy. So we finished our walk. I didn't think any more about it, until a week later, I went to my local library. And as I stood at the circulation desk, I saw this bright yellow piece of paper listing all the library activities for the month. But the only words I saw were inside a little black box, and they said, memoir writing class, second Wednesday of the month. And I thought, hmm, that sounds interesting. So I picked up that piece of paper, and something jiggled in my brain. And I went to the next class and listened. And then I went back the next month, with my one handwritten piece of notebook paper telling why I wanted to write about Prudence Island. And at the end of the class, the teacher encouraged me to keep writing. And she said, you need to write a book. So I kept going back every month, a new story. Until finally, that first page of notebook paper became the first chapter in the fairy home. I began this journey for my children and my grandchildren. I wanted them to have the memories that I had. In the course of writing the book, I became reacquainted with a friend on Prudence Island. She was a summer swimming buddy. And although I hadn't seen her for 50 years, we renewed our friendship and she told me I could come back and visit as often as I wanted and stay as long as I liked. And every time I went back, the pull to stay on Prudence was stronger. Every time, I didn't want to get on the ferry and go home. So although I started writing this book for my children and my grandchildren, I found pieces of myself that I had left behind on the island 60 years ago. And just very briefly, I'd like to read an excerpt from something I heard from a reader who wrote me a letter, and this was the unexpected reward at the end of the journey. I've just finished your memoir. My heart has been smiling the whole while. 
What a gift of love this tiny blue book was, most especially the last chapter. To find out that the book was a gift to other people, that it opened their memory door, was an incredible reward. And I hope the Ferry Home will open your memory door, because everybody has a story. What's yours? Thank you. Thank you very much, Abby. We will pick Bob Shore. All right. Uh, our next author is Mary Catherine Volk. She's the author of Believe in Forever, How to Recognize Signs from Departed Loved Ones. At age six, Mary was given the gift of knowing. Death is just a transition. Her book details stories of her deceased loved ones, sending signs of comfort to her grieving family. Mary was inspired to write this book after realizing the signs came not only shortly after their passing, but also at special occasions. There you go. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Yes, I was not by profession um, um, a writer. I was more in sales and marketing. And because of this near-death experience that I had when I was six years old, I always had a knowing and the ability to be able to receive signs from my loved ones. When I was young, it was just something that I kept within my family. Um, but in my mid-twenties, um, my family, an extended family, um, started a series of deaths similar to, it seems like, the other panelists here. Um, and within five years, from the time I was 26 to the time I was 31, I had lost five family members, all of them very, very close. Um, had we not been open to receiving signs from them, letting us know that not only had they made it, to, to heaven, to spirit, but that they were with each other because sometimes they would appear with each other. This really um, saved my family and my extended family, my in-laws and my brother's in-laws. Um, and it was a, a wonderful gift. It was a wonderful gift that I think kept us all together and continued to have children and to not give up knowing we were young, but we had a life ahead of us. And if anything, it, it made us want to live more fulfilled lives in memory of all of them. So it wasn't until later on in life when the normal time frame for my friends to lose maybe a grandparent or a mother or a father, that I realized other families were not like my family. Um, they didn't openly talk about signs um, that they may have been receiving. And that many people didn't know what the signs were. And they did not trust them. So that's part of what um, I started writing. I started writing a lot of these stories. But it wasn't until um, my husband passed when my girls were teenagers and my first daughter's wedding came and we knew he was going to be at the wedding, my daughter and I, but his mother did not believe. She had lost two children. So I asked him for a very clear sign that he, would, that he was at the wedding to let her know. Um, he gave me the signs I asked for. I asked for blue skies, sunshine, and over 50 degree weather, December 11th at the New York Towers in Narragansett. It was 54 degrees and very blue skies. So it was a fabulous, fabulous day. We, um, everyone felt the presence of not only him, but other family members there. And even my mother-in-law shared with me that she did now believe. So I thought that was just a wonderful gift until the photographs started getting developed. And especially with three photograph photographers um, and three different cameras. Um, we had these white orbs strategically where he would have been standing in the family photographs. 
And I just felt it was such a gift that I wanted to write a book, put these, these pictures in, and tell these stories. So for all the other brides and grooms out there, getting married after they had lost a parent, or the graduation days, those special days, our parents are with us, our grandparents are with us. Um, and again, I did not, I was not a writer. I was more of a, of a um, you know, in sales and marketing. But the one thing I knew was, I had to be aware of who was my audience. Who was I writing this book for? And I think that is, that's key. Even here with the panelists, I thought, well, what, what message can I give to all of you? So any of you that are thinking of writing, think of who your audience is and what is your unique gift? What has been unique about your life that is really a gift for you to share? They know um, With the, the rest of the world, because that's really what it is. We're opening our hearts, we're opening our lives to people when we, when we write a book. But what I have found is, it is so rewarding to have people like um, Debbie receiving a letter, or even now when we do these book signing events, and I have people come up and tell me how my book has changed their life, and that they want to purchase several best copies for holiday gifts. Um, that, then you know, and you, you, I don't know, I can almost feel my loved one smiling down on me, knowing this was part of, a, a mission, I guess, out of our soul journey together. Um, so um, I would like to leave you with that, that if anybody has any doubts about signs, um, um, a lot of times we don't know what they are, but our loved ones um, continue to send their love in to be with us during special occasions or in times of need. So just feel free to ask them, ask for their help, and trust that you will receive it. So thank you all for coming today. And thank you to all my panelists who did so well, kept within the time frame. Um, we're very happy to have told our story to all of you. And again, because I'm a promoter, they are for sale, and you can come up and ask us about them, we'll sign them for gifts, or whatever you'd like. And also, uh, we're open for questions. Please, uh, we have a few minutes left here. Feel free to ask any of us anything, and we'll do our very best to uh, respond. Who's going to put the first hand up? Truly, there you go. Can you sir? Hi, Kelly. Hi. I did buy your book. Yes, you did. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have, I'm writing my own book now. I guess it's a memoir, but it's, it's non-fiction, it's my story, um, and I call it Murder of the Project Sun, and how I, how I cured PTSD without drugs, without murder, right? And my family turned against me, because I refused to take any more psychiatric drugs. Get to the point, Kelly, where I actually had to change my name because I did not want to be associated with it. So now I'm writing the book. <laughs> and their, their deeds are very, very bad. But I don't feel like I should pull back. I think their deeds are well reported. You know, they're, it, you can read them everywhere. You know, and their real names I'm going to use. And I know there's a fallout, but I've already decided that I don't want them to sound like anyone. How about you? Do you uh, write off your entire family? Yes. I had, they, they had, like I said, they had already become alienated. We really tried hard to keep our family together. Um, the thought of suing our family, you know, my niece ran over my son, it was definitely her fault, but we never would have done that, that was an accident, you know, so it was pretty crazy that then when we were in a lawsuit for the next baby, which had nothing to do with them, that they would insert themselves into 
a legal matter, right? Because we were trying, we, that was horrifying to us. Um, so yeah, they were, they were all, there's so much more to the story, obviously, but they were so very hurtful towards us and it's just bent over back. What my niece did was an accident. The rest of the stuff that happened was deliberate. So it's hard to forgive people like that, BS. You know, it's hard to forgive people who aren't sorry. Who never say they're sorry and aren't. That's a perfect example. That sentence is exactly it. It's hard to forgive people not saying they're sorry. That's the first thing they did. Right. And in some in some instances are, are proud of it. But um, you know, there's probably narcissism and other sociopathic things going on within my own family. I don't know about yours. Um, you know, the last thing I ever wanted to do was be in another lawsuit. Like I said, this we had this medical malpractice lawsuit. So ten days of a trial, I mean excuse me, seven full days of a trial, I lost ten pounds. I never want to be in another court of law as long as I live. So that was partly why I was so cautious or feeling so uh, you know, nervous about it a little bit. And I was writing about lawyers and doctors, so um, like I said, I mean, I think I think you still you need to get your first drafts out with their names and then maybe consult with a lawyer. That would be my advice, I think. And do we have another question, Madam? I saw you first. Let me press this to you so everybody can can hear. It makes it easy. There's enough room. Some of the doctors I would just write like Doctor H. I didn't use their name. But I sent a copy to all the doc doctors that, not the ones that I sued, excuse me. There are other doctors in here that I didn't sue. I sent them all a copy. Um, so yeah, I did. And the lawyers, their names are used. Could you ask your question again? Could you stand up and say it so people can hear you? I, I know that, or you can tell it to me and I will. Uh... Looking for a memoir coach or a memoir workshop in the area? Yeah. Uh, maybe I could take a half of that question. Uh, again, let's go back to uh, Debbie over here. She found hers at a lo local library. You may want to check their, their events that they're having. Uh, there are, you don't want to go to college per se to take a whole curriculum, but there are college courses that are offered. Uh, this may take you, it takes a while to get into memoir writing, or you can look around in your area, look on Facebook for writers groups, and get into them. They may be writing memoir, they may be writing travel stories, and that way you bring in a little section, a couple of words, a thousand words of what you're writing and pass it around to everybody, and they will critique you and you've got to put on a very strong skin to take that critique. You've done all that. I'm looking for one-on-one -on -one workshop. Does anybody have any idea? One-on-one -on -one writing coach? I, I have the name of a writing coach. I do. There we go. S Stuart Horowitz. I can give you his information at my table. You might look for a writing group, too. Writing groups are great. Critique groups. Mm -hmm. No, it shouldn't be a negative. I'm going, to, I'm going to say that. If you say that we don't get you and there's five or six people in the group, I'm going to be a little tough here and say that maybe you're not coming across the right way. You need to take constructive criticism. That's hard. They're telling you this doesn't work. Um, it's hard, but try it their way too. They don't get you? All right. Well, perhaps a single writing coach one-on-one -on -one would be better. And they are. They're there. They're searching. They're out there. Yeah. Uh, someone else had a question. I think it was you. Yes. Would you stand up so we hear you? Because you've got this background going on over here. Can you come forward and... She's asking if I changed the names of doctors in the book. Yeah. No, I didn't. Sometimes I just, I, I was saying, I, sometimes I would write just like Dr. H or Dr. P, because it, it really wasn't important what their name was. I understand, yeah, right. 
I actually yeah. gave um, copies of my book to my doctors, told them they were in it, and asked them if they wanted me to change their name. And they said no. So they do have that. But also, Linda was sharing earlier with me, like she changed her ex-husband's name to Drew, right? Dean. Dean. But everyone knows that it's her ex-husband. Like, you know, <laughs> it's like, well, everyone else in the story is know me that read my book know that it's him, but strangers <laughs> We have a few more minutes. Anyone else? Yes. Could you speak loudly or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when you changed your ex name to Drew, D. D. Did you do that to protect yourself? Yes, my. Let me ask. <laughs> yeah. Um. No. No, I didn't. Um. I had the advice of a of an attorney that's not a literary attorney, um, and I changed his name and I changed the name of the live-in that was cheating on me with the mistress that lived on our boat. <laughs> um, I've recently found out that my ex-husband has read the book, or at least the parts that he was in, and I haven't gotten a phone call. So, yeah. and to clarify, slander is spoken, yeah. and libel is written. Oh, okay. What is the definition? Libel. Of Libel is written is what you're worried about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I say in my, you know, as Kelly said earlier, what you put in your um, disclaimer. Yeah. I said that this was my memory, my interpretation, and everybody has their own story and their own um, perception of what happened. And if you did have a problem with it, I, you know, I write what you don't have it. You know. So. One more question. Hi. Hi. Um, this might be for Debbie. I'm writing my memoir about my childhood, and I'm finding it a challenge. When do I use the child's voice, and when do I speak as the adult, reflecting back? Because sometimes when I'm writing as a five-year-old, I don't want to write with the vocabulary of a five-year-old, but to tell the story from the five-year-old's perspective, I'm finding it a challenge. I wrote the stories as I remember them as a child, but I wrote them as an adult looking back. And I also began each chapter with a present day occurrence that, that triggered the memory of my childhood. So I wrote that in the present, and what I wrote about my childhood, I wrote in the past. Because that's the other thing that gets tricky is what tense to use. So the be very beginning and very end of my chapters are present tense. They're memory. They're what I'm doing right now, and then the body of the story is in the past tense, but written as a childhood memory. One more. Yes, we do, sir. Uh, I don't know. I'll kind of start and then we kind of pass it down here. You're asking where to find the time to write. Um, well, it's, you have so many hours in the day that you live. You have one choice, you can get a half, up a half an hour early in the morning and sit at that computer and stare at it. And sometimes you may get a paragraph, sometimes you may get 200 words. And then you go about your day. Or you can take a, a half a day on Saturday or the end of the day. I happen to be a night person. So I'm 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock with a glass of wine writer. Maybe that's a lot different than somebody wakes up at 6.30 and sits down and they write. But you have to discipline yourself that you deserve this time and just write a page a day. Give yourself 200 words a day. And if you don't make the 200 words, you're not gonna sit down and write your whole book in a week or a month or whatever. But you have to start, okay? So you gotta start with about 200 words or a limit and keep it to yourself for a while and then join a writing group or, or why don't go to school. But you have to begin to write your story. Don't talk about it either. That's another lesson we've all learned. You cannot tell your wife or your friends, oh, this was a great part, this is gonna be. So you tell five or six people about this wonderful memoir you're gonna write and what happened to you. And by the time you go to sit down and write it, you've got to tell a lot of people. So you've got to keep it inside and only tell the page. Promise? Okay, Linda, how'd you do it? Well, I, part of my 
story was that I got laid off from my job, so I had the blessing of, of being able to do this full time, but I didn't um, have it full time for the whole, right from the start to the, when I published it. So I, when I was working full time, I, I didn't, I couldn't find the time to do it, honestly, and I know where you're, where you're coming from, but it's just like those things like going to the gym or whatever those things are that we don't do, we're not passionate about it. I feel like if you're passionate about something, you're gonna find the time to do it. Whether it's in the morning or the afternoon or whatever it is, you'll, you'll, you'll find it. And the other thing I would say to, to Judith's point, um, I didn't have an expect. I think once, one of the problems is that you have an expectation that you're gonna, you're gonna write a chapter when you sit down. And when you don't, you're like, oh, then I'm not gonna sit down next time to do it because I put too high of an expectation on myself. So just start with something small. Whether it's 200 words or 100 or whatever it is, or even just an outline, don't put these high expectations on yourself that you're gonna like finish it. Does that make sense? Someone helped me. All my great writing heroes, and we had structure for writing. And he was the early riser. Uh, he'd get up very early, and he said every day he had to write for six hours, no matter what, six hours. And then, the rest of the day, he would uh, have as much fun, laughter, and love, and, and whatever, until he would actually fall down asleep. <laughs> and then he would do that the next day, until he had finished the project. But he wrote six hours every day, and he was an early riser, so I'm an early riser. I got up at four o'clock, you know, and I write, and it's fun. Another good thing is to get yourself into a writing group or a writing class where you, where you have to show up every two weeks with something, but do it. And don't talk to people about what you're doing. Just get there and write it, and you'll do it. And maybe next year you could be on this panel. Okay. Um, we could answer a lot of questions, I'm sure, and thank you to all of my panelists who put in the, their labor and their love to sit here and tell you about their memoirs. Hopefully you'll, you'll buy one of our books if you like it. And we're kind of stuck on time here. They're going to shoo us all out. So thank you so much for listening to us. Bye-bye.